today. Great. If you guys would, would you read with me on the all sections as we read through God's word? He leads us into worship this morning. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your work shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. We're about to sing an, an, <clears throat> an older hymn that we grew up with. We, we put a little bit of, um, put a little seasoning on it this morning. And, uh, um, I'm grateful for my lovely bride up here today. I can't sing very well today, even worse than normal. So if you guys would, would you guys just sing out today and just allow your voices to be the, the true choir this morning, giving praise and worship to the Lord our Father. Calvary's mount outpoured There with the 
Welcome to Bellevue, fall break at Bellevue, and it is great to see those of you all who are still in town who have gathered together to worship the Lord and uh, to encourage one another, and it is a beautiful day, a wonderful day to be in the Lord's house this morning. If you're a guest with us, I hope you got a bulletin when you came in. If you did, at the bottom there's a tear-off connection card, and if you could take just a few minutes and fill that out with your information, at the end of the service, uh, we would ask that as you depart the worship center out either set of double doors, uh, there is a blue tablecloth table there with a smiling person there. And if you would give it to that person, they would love to give you a gift just thanking you for being with us this morning and worshiping with us. Let's take a couple of minutes and shake some hands around us and we'll continue to worship. A reading, a reading from, so from God's Word this morning from the book of Hebrews. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who were enrolled in heaven, and to the God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than, than the, that of the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse Him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused Him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject Him who warns from heaven. 
At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now, he has promised. Yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. The Word of God.
led by the Spirit, will walk the heavenly way. God, just like the rain poured from the skies last night after a long drought, I pray that your spirit would rain down upon us this morning in the drought of our soul.
together. Father God, it's so awesome to be in this place. Gathering here, waiting as your Spirit falls upon us to gather us into your presence that we might worship you. Lord God, speak to us as we turn to your word. Change and transform us. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you with our gifts, with our tithes and our offerings. And Lord, just have your way with us this morning. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Good morning. Afraid I'm uh, going to blow somebody away with this thing. All right. Uh, so we're glad you guys are here this morning. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to go ahead and turn to John chapter 14. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 6. For most of you, this will be a passage of Scripture you're at least somewhat familiar with, and uh, you'll understand why we're going over it here in just a, a minute. I uh, also want to encourage you to open up your Bellevue apps if you haven't done that yet, so you can follow along with the notes there. Uh, Pastor Greg is gone this week, but uh, we are starting up a two-week series on fear. It's called Fear Not, and uh, he'll be back next week to share the second part of that series. This week, I'm starting us off, and so we're going to be talking about uh, one of the biggest fears that we have. Now, if you've ever heard somebody present a sermon on fear, you have inevitably heard them go through either ridiculous fears that people have or a list of fears that people have, like a top 10. And I will tell you that as I've looked through this, uh, the top 10 hasn't changed a whole lot over the years. Uh, you still, at the very top, typically will have two. You'll have fear of public speaking and uh, fear of death. And so this morning, I thought it was only appropriate that I speak publicly to you about death. So um, that is, uh, that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, but I'm not scared. So uh, you may be. Um, so we're going to be talking about this, and I, I actually, I got to thinking about fear quite a bit over the last couple of weeks. I've been preparing this, and I, I thought back to my childhood, and my sister attends church here, and she'll be here in the second service, and she was really excited when she heard that I was going to be talking about fear, because she said, well, you were scared of everything. And she's right, I was. I was scared of just about anything, you'd name it, I was scared of it. Heights, up to a certain extent, I was a little scared um, up to a certain extent. Didn't realize that was kind of funny. Um, I also, I was, I was scared of dogs, still kind of a little bit if they're big and mean and they bark and have teeth. Um, I, uh, I was never scared of clowns. Um, I know a lot of people are, but that was never really a big fear that I had. I was scared of the dark. I'm not going to lie. I'm still a little scared of the dark. Uh, if I'm walking through the building, if it's a church building in particular, uh, it sounds like the Holy Spirit's walking around the place when it's dark, and that scares me. Um, but one fear that I have had since I was a child that's actually stuck with me, and I, I'm not super proud of it, but it is one that I have, 
uh, I'm, I'm a little bit afraid of flying in a plane. Um, as a kid, I was terrified, just absolutely terrified. Anytime uh, we would be going on a trip that would require us to fly, which wasn't very often. We, we didn't spend the money to, to fly. We were more like the Griswolds. We had some really long family drives, and, and I love those family trips because all the family, you know, situations that you have, all the fun that you have, and also because you avoid being in a plane. And uh, so I, I never really enjoyed it as a kid. Um, we only went a few times, but as I've gotten older, it's gotten a little bit better, right? But there's still just a little bit of uneasiness. Uh, in fact, when Becky and I got married, which in March will be 17 years, I shouldn't chuckle when I say that, but it's still kind of amazing that she said, yeah, okay. Um, and so when I when we went on our, our honeymoon, we flew to Florida, and uh, we had to stop in Atlanta for this, and you know, it was a layover thing, and uh, so w- that meant we had to take two flights down there, which was terrifying twice, um, and so as soon as we took off to fly, and some of y'all can relate to this, I mean, we'd just gotten married, you know, we're in our early 20s, we'd just gotten married, uh, we're super excited, we're going to stay at a condo on the beach, like, it's going to be amazing, we actually, this is us, we went to a, uh, a spring training baseball game, because that's how we roll, and so we were very excited about heading down there, and I remember as the plane takes off, I grab her hand, and I squeeze, and I know that there was a moment where she, she was sitting there, and she thought, wow, he loves me so much, And then the next moment, I know she thought, this man's going to kill me. Um, Because I squeezed and squeezed and squeezed for probably the two-hour flight. I would say a good hour and 45 minutes of it were just me laying in my, sitting in my seat, squeezing as hard as I possibly could. I was scared out of my mind. And and some of you all can relate to that. We have lots of different fears, and some of those cause paralysis in us. And, and most fears, we can, we can kind of bring them down to two reasons that we have them. One is that we've had a bad experience somewhere along the way. Like with me, when I think about flying in a plane, the reason I have a hard time, one of the reasons I have a hard time, is because I've seen way too many TV shows and way too many movies where the plane just doesn't quite make it. And that scares me. The second reason is that I have some, some deep issues with you know, control and, and, and not being in control of things. Some of y'all can probably relate to that because when you're in a plane, You're not controlling anything. Pretty much every fear we have, we can bring it back to those two reasons. We've had a bad experience, and we don't understand what it is that we're scared of. And we don't know how to deal with what it is that we're scared of. I mean, you think about somebody who is afraid of clowns, for example. I'm just curious. Anybody want to admit you're afraid of clowns? Oh, you poor people. Okay. Okay. Here's the, here's the thing. Most people that are scared of clowns, either they, you know, knew that there was a serial killer at one time that dressed like a clown, or they watched the movie It, or maybe they just had a really bad circus experience. I don't know. But there are reasons that have led us to that. When we think about the fear of death, the reason death scares us so much is it's permanent. One moment you're here, the next moment you're not. One moment our friend, our family member is here, the next moment they're not. You don't get do-overs when it comes to death. It does scare us, and it's a legitimate fear. But this morning, we're committed as followers of Christ to live our lives in a way that honors and glorifies God. We're committed to living out the, the directives that he gives us through Scripture. And so this morning, as we look through John chapter 14, we're going to try to answer this question. How do we keep it together when we're thinking about the end? How do we hold it together when we're thinking about death? So again, I want to encourage you to look at John chapter 14. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit. Here's what Jesus says. He says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, as we read through this very familiar passage of Scripture, it will bring back memories for many of us of funerals that we've attended, of family members and friends that we've lost. God, it may bring back thoughts of the first time we understood that Jesus was the only way for us to come into a relationship with you. Father, this morning, I pray that you will help us to unpack and understand as much as we can about what Jesus said here. Help us to apply it to our lives and live out our faith in a way that truly brings honor and glory to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, we see three things in this passage that will help us figure out how we keep it together when we think about the end. Because let's make no mistake about it, death is a big deal. It's literally one of only a few things that everyone in here has in common. We will die. We will have family members. We will have friends. We will have co-workers. We'll have neighbors. We will deal with death. And how we deal with death will not only say a lot about our relationship with Christ, but truly can play a part in helping us to grow in our relationship with Christ, which is something that God desires for us to have throughout our lives, growth. And so let's look at these three things. The first thing that we see, the first step we need to take if we truly are committed to keeping it together when we think about this stuff, is we need to protect our hearts. Protect your heart. The very first thing he says here is, let not your hearts be troubled. Now that's kind of a weird way to start a conversation, and that's because he didn't start the conversation like this. He's been talking with the disciples. If you move back up into chapter 13, you're going to see a, a conversation that takes place there with the disciples where he tells them that he's leaving. Now, we know what he means. They don't necessarily understand. If you know much about the disciples, and you may or may not, the disciples are notorious for not really understanding what Jesus means when he says things. Now, I don't know about you, but there are a lot of times when God you know, speaks to me through his word where I don't understand what he means either. But Jesus makes it clear to them that he's with them now, but he won't be soon. So they may not know that he's dying, but they know he's going to be gone. And as you read it, as you look through it, you start to see some frustration, some concern, some aggravation, some anxiety start to creep up. In fact, Peter says to Jesus, he says, you know, I, I want to go with you. Why can't I go with you now? Why can't I go? And, and he says, I would lay down my life for you. And Jesus looks at him and says, no, you're going to deny me three times. Not exactly the response you would want to hear from, from Jesus, but, but Jesus looks on the disciples and he says, you know what, I can tell where they are. I can tell where their hearts are and I can tell where their hearts are going. And so Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Jesus recognizes something and he shares it with them and he shares it with us and this is important for us to know. Fear can be overwhelming. Fear can be overwhelming. Fear can keep us from acting how God desires for us to act. Fear can change the way we think about things. Fear can change our patterns and our plans and our processes in life if we let it. I'll give you a great example. Um, when I was in college, it's been a while, uh, back in the, uh, the fall of 1999, I was getting ready to head to a conference over Christmas break. Some of y'all have heard me talk about it before. We did this thing with Campus Crusade for Christ called Christmas Conference, and it was the week after Christmas, and it would go usually around the 27th all the way up through January 1st. And my favorite part about this conference every year was you would get to pray in the new year. Like, we didn't have a big ball drop celebration type thing. We would pray in the new year. So at midnight, you were praying. You're talking to God. How cool is that? And we would have worship with that sometimes. And it was just an amazing experience. And everybody always loved it. And, and I remember in the fall of 1999, we were told that for whatever reason, they were going to change the schedule. We weren't going to be staying through New Year's. We were actually going to be heading on home on the 31st. And I remember thinking, this is sad. We're not going to get to do this. I don't understand what's going on. And then we all figured out very quickly what it was. Because if you remember back to the fall of 1999, those of you that are old enough to remember, there's a little thing coming called Y2K. And as you know, it drastically changed the world. 
just kidding, all right? But there was, there was legitimate fear that it was going to. The, if you're not familiar with what it was or you don't remember real well, basically the whole idea was that all the computers in the world, and this is not scientific, so if you need to fact check this later, you can come talk to me, but what I remember about it was that essentially all the computers in the world used two digits for their dates. And so it would be, you know, instead of 1992, it would be 92 or 96 or 99. And the fear was that once it rolled over to midnight on January 1st, 2000, that everything was just going to go nuts. <laughs> I mean, the things I remember hearing as a college student, these were legitimate things people said. Now, granted, I was at, I was at, college, so you hear all kinds of weird stuff, but, but the things I remember hearing was that all the computers in the world were going to just explode. They couldn't handle it. They were just going to blow up. Some of y'all remember hearing that. Uh, there was fear that they were all going to catch fire, that buildings would be burning down. My favorite one, and this goes right back to my fears, was that planes were going to fall right out of the sky. Do y'all remember some of these? And people changed their entire plans and their schedules and their lives based on fear of what was coming. Now, we know on this side of it, nothing happened, at least nothing major. A few little glitches here and there probably, but nothing drastic. Fear can overwhelm us to the point that we don't do things that make sense, more importantly, that we don't do things that God desires for us to do. And so Jesus looks down at the disciples, and he looks down at us, and he says, protect your heart first and foremost, because if your heart goes and your mind goes, then your feet and your hands will go, and you will not be effective for the kingdom. If you sit around thinking about death all day long, you will accomplish very, very little for the kingdom of God. And so there's a better reason for us, or there's a reason for us to, to not do this. Why we protect our hearts? Because death has lost its sting. I, I love that verse. Now, here's the thing. It's over in 1 Corinthians 15. You can flip there if you want. Uh, it's verses 54 through 57. I'm going to read it here in just a second. You may have read this verse of scripture before, or you may not have, but you have sung a song before, and you heard it, and you thought, ooh, that sounds good. I like that. Now, maybe you knew it was from scripture. Maybe you didn't, but we're going to read it here together in 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 57. Here's what it says. It says, when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, we have no reason, I want to establish that early, we have no reason to legitimately fear death, death of ourselves, death of our friends and family members, if we know Christ. Why? Because he has taken the sting and the power out of death and sin. He did this. He's done this for us. So we have no reason to fear if we know Christ, if we love Christ, if we live with Christ and honor Christ in our lives. It's an important point for us to protect our hearts one of the things I love about Scripture and I love about Jesus is when he not only tells us what to do, but then he also goes ahead to tell us how to do it. In verse 1, he tells us how to do it, and this is our second point this morning. Not only do we protect our hearts, but number two, we believe in Jesus. If that's not the simplest Sunday morning point you ever heard in your whole life, believe in Jesus. But my goodness, how true it is. If we want to keep it together when we think about death, when we think about the end, we better believe in Jesus. He says here in verse 1, he says, let not your hearts be troubled, but then he goes on to say, believe in God, believe also in me. Now, understand when Jesus is telling them to believe in him, he's saying more than just believe that I'm here, believe what I say, believe that you know, I'm good, believe that I'm right, believe that I'm true, believe all, any of these things. He's saying more than that. What he's actually telling them and what he's telling us this morning as well is to place your beliefs in him. Place your faith in him. 
If you want your heart to be protected as you think about a future that can be a little scary, then you need to make sure your heart is placed in Jesus Christ. That your faith, your trust are all in Him. What I love about this is that the instructions are clear regarding Jesus. The instructions are clear regarding Jesus. He doesn't mess around. He says, this is what you need to do. You want your life to be better? You want your life to be peaceful? You want your life to be filled with joy? Believe in Jesus. Believe in me. Now, this is important for us to understand, and as we did with the first point here, I want to also say that there's a really important reason for it. See, we're going to struggle. We're going to struggle with things in life. We're going to struggle with difficult situations. We're going to struggle with fears from time to time. We're going to struggle with the realities of what we have to go through as human beings. One of those is death. We will struggle with that. We are wired to struggle with that. We're wired to struggle with that because we're wired for relationship. We're wired for community. And when that community gets shaken up, when relationships have to end because someone's not with us anymore, it should be a struggle. It is difficult for us. There are no two ways about it. So don't misunderstand this morning and say that this is all easy. But understand this, in every struggle that we face in life, regardless of what it is, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the solution. He's where we go and he's who comes to us to help us through the most difficult circumstances we will face in life. And in this particular topic of talking about death, Jesus has already won the battle for us. Look with me over in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2. I do want you all to, to turn to this one. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. I'm going to read a, a couple of verses here for you. Of what Jesus has truly done for us. One of the best descriptions of script, in Scripture. Of what Jesus has done for us when it comes, in particular, to fearing death. What did he do? What has he done? Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. It says, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Now understand here, just so you can get these two points when we believe in Jesus, the instructions are clear for us. Follow him, know him, love him. But the second part of this is just as important. Jesus has already won this battle. Jesus has already taken the power of sin and death away. He came, he lived a perfect life so that we could have forgiveness. He lived a perfect life. He died a sinner's death. He took on our sin, our shame, our punishment on himself on the cross, and then he was resurrected. He was brought back to life, showing the power of God to work and save people's souls. Jesus did this for us that if we will believe in him, we will place our faith and our trust in him and make him the Lord of our lives, turning from our sin and letting him be in control of who we are and what we think and what we do. If we will make that decision and make that commitment, then we will spend eternity with God in heaven and have no reason to fear what will come. But more than that, we will spend an abundant life here on earth. Jesus has freed us from bondage. We say this, this is a churchy term, let's be honest. It's a churchy term for us that loses all meaning on us for the most part. We were slaves to our sin. We were slaves to the power of death, and then Jesus entered the picture. He entered the story, and he said, no more. You are free 
from fear. You are free from the fear of sin and the fear of death. It has no power on you and no power over you. It should make you feel good this morning that Jesus has already done it and all we have to do in order to enjoy it and find peace in a peaceless world is to focus our lives on Christ. It's encouragement for us this morning that Jesus has already won the battle. There's one more point that I want to make this morning. One more thing that we need to do according to this passage of Scripture. If we desire deeply to keep it together when we think about these things, to not let fear, not let the fear of death keep us from walking with Christ, keep us from living our lives, then we need to do this one last thing. Look with me at verse 6. Now Thomas has just asked a question, okay? Now if you know anything about Thomas in Scripture, one of his names is Doubting Thomas, because Thomas asks a lot of questions. He gets concerned about a lot of things that Jesus does and says, and he needs proof of different things. He needs to, to see it. He needs to hear it. He needs to believe it. And he questions Jesus here. When Jesus says, uh, I'm going to this place, and uh, you'll know how to get there, and, and he says, we don't even know where you're going. How in the world would we know how to get there? How would we know the way? And I love this. I love this. This is one of my absolute favorite verses in Scripture. And I mean, I've prob- I'm like many of you, I've probably heard it a hundred times at funerals. But that's not why I love it. I love it because it speaks to the character of Jesus Christ. The absolute purest form of the character of Jesus Christ who he was and what he did. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Woo! Just gives me goosebumps. I love it. And it should get you excited too. Why? Because there is no other option. There is no other way. Jesus lays it out as clearly as he possibly can. If we want to know God, we better know Jesus. If we want to spend eternity with God, we better have a relationship with Jesus. We need to trust in the one true hope. Now, I want to talk to you for just a second about names. About nicknames, to be more specific. Now, this will sound a little strange because... This isn't a nickname for Jesus, but, but it's what makes me think of, and I think it's, it helps us to remember kind of how this works. Um, I love nicknames. I love them. There's only one person, I think, in the whole world that I don't call by a nickname or a shortened name or a fun name or anything like that. That's Becky. Like, people who are closest to her call her Beck. I've never been able to do it. I mean, I call her Sweetheart or Sweetie or, you know, Hun or whatever, but, um, but I just, I can't shorten her name. I can't give her like a cool nickname. But I do it with the youth group. Uh, a lot of the kids, I give them nicknames. Uh, one, it helps me remember their name or not have to worry about remembering their name because I can just call them their nickname and I'm good on that. Um, that sounded awful and I said that in front of the whole church. Anyway, <laughs> here's the thing. I do that with them and, and with myself, I had nicknames growing up. I, I was a, a baseball player. Y'all have heard me talk about that before. I was a pitcher. And uh, there was a a parent of a kid when I was in high school that said I pitched a lot like a guy that played and pitched for the Cleveland Indians. And uh, the Cleveland Indians had a mascot. I don't know if they still do, but at the time they had a mascot named Chief Wahoo. And uh, so this guy would call me Chief or Wahoo or Chief Wahoo. And uh, I loved that. Um, He also, uh, my number was 14, so they called me Charlie Hustle at one point, which my dad did not like because I didn't hustle. Um... They, uh, they also, uh, they would call me KW, or they, I had a guy in college that just called me Watkins, and he would say it real weird. Um, I tried to give myself a nickname when I was growing up. I thought I was going to be this amazing basketball player, um, and so uh, I tried to call myself Shaquille Watkins. Um, I'm not proud of that one, okay? I, that's not, not the best one. And then, I actually, I worked with a guy a few years later, uh, who tried to call me Hoss. 
And I didn't like that either. Um, for a couple of reasons. One, Hoss sounds like a great big guy, and I was like, come on, man, seriously? I call you shrimpy, but that's not going to be nice. And, um, but I, I didn't like it because my dad called me Hoss when I was growing up. Like, that's what, dad would call me Hoss Cat, and I never really understood what the cat was about, but it was Hoss Cat. He'd call me Hoss Cat. Um, so nicknames are, are neat. Nicknames are, are fun and interesting, but, but what nicknames do, what, what, what we're doing when we call somebody something other than just their name is we usually are describing one part of their character that sticks out the most. You know, he called me Chief Wahoo because I pitched like this other guy. I didn't throw as hard as him, but, but I pitched like this other guy. I wanted to be Shekilo Watkins because I thought I was going to be a seven-foot basketball player. Um, didn't quite make it. When we think about Jesus, these are not nicknames, but I want you to think through some of the names that Jesus either calls himself or is called by other people. I want you to think about how he goes about it. I want you to think about the ones that matter the most. You know, he's called the gate. He's called the door. He's called the living water. He's called the bread of life. He's called the word of God. He's called the son of God. He's called the son of man. He's called the one. In this passage of scripture, he says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. He is the one true hope that we have. See, when Jesus says, I'm the way, what he means for us is very, very specific. He says, I am the way that you can have a relationship with God. I am the way that you can inherit eternity with God. I am the way that you can live a life that matters, that has purpose and meaning. When he says, I am the truth, what he's saying is that there's nothing wrong in him. Everything about him is righteous. Everything about him is true and honest and sincere. He is the truth of the whole world, truer than anything else we will ever see or imagine. He, when he says he is the life, what he is saying is that he provides life he provides life with purpose. He provides life with meaning. He provides life with direction. And those who don't have life through Christ are seeking and searching for something that matters. And they will only find it. We will only find it through relationship with Jesus Christ because he is the life. And then he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. And he's not kidding when he says it. We will not see the face of God without a relationship with Jesus Christ. We will not be in the presence of a holy God without a relationship with Jesus Christ. He paid the price for us so that we could have that relationship, so that we could have that eternity, so that we could have that life. He did this for us. We have no reason to fear death. Why? Not because it's not scary, it is scary. Not because it's not permanent, it's absolutely permanent. The reason we have no fear or no reason to fear death is because we know the one who has already claimed victory over it. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we will not need to fear much. And we certainly won't need to fear death. Because when we close our eyes here on earth, we will open them in the presence of a holy God. But I want to encourage you this morning, if you don't have that relationship, then you don't have that peace that surpasses all understanding. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then you are lacking in the one thing that will change your life forever and take away all reason for fear. Jesus is the one who wants to change your life. And if you're here and you've never made that decision before, in just a moment we're going to have a time of invitation uh, where we'll have a pastor or two down here in the front who would be happy to talk with you and walk you through that decision. And if you've never made that decision today, then I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you, I want to push you. Make that decision today. If you feel God's leading you to do it, don't wait. There's a tendency anytime the pastor's out, we want to wait. We want to wait. We want to wait. Don't wait. It's the most important decision you'll ever make in your whole life. Why would you put off 
the most important decision you can make. Maybe you're here this morning and you have a relationship with Christ. Your life has been changed by Jesus, but you know this is a church you want to be a part of. Why don't you come let us know that too during the invitation time. Just come and tell one of the pastors that you want to come be a part of Bellevue. We'd be happy to walk you through that decision. We'll also have a, an area up here at the front that is an altar. It's a, an opportunity for you to pray. But before we get to that, that invitation, I want to do one thing real quick. You know, we talked about the names of Jesus. I'm a big believer that each name is, is significant. It represents who he is, but each one is also specific. It's unique. And so I'm going to lead us through a little prayer time here before our, our closing invitation time. So if you would, just kind of close your eyes, bow your heads. It's going to be a very simple prayer, folks. I'm just going to pray three things, and I want you to repeat them after me. Because we are going to try to tap in this morning to who Jesus really is and what he really did for us. So with your eyes closed and your heads bowed, just repeat after me. Jesus, you are the way. Jesus, you are the truth. Jesus, you are the life. Amen.